I was sharing with Gail this morning that when I was practicing this morning, I was going through the music, and my phone sitting beside me, and my Google Assistant came on and asked if she could help me. <laughs> I said, yeah, can you sing harmony? It didn't answer. <laughs> so as Christmas approaches, we're going to sing more and more Christmas carols, so these are going to be familiar to you, so please sing out. Hey, <laughs> 
probably helps if I turn it on. <laughs> okay, our sermon title this morning is Finding the Joy of Christmas from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1-12 through 12 in our series, The Heart of Christmas. Well, last week, we noted that while Christmas season is supposed to be, as the song says, the most wonderful time of the year, for many, it can be the most difficult time of the year. Unexpected interruptions like the loss of a job or broken relationships or illness or tornadoes can steal the joy from the season. In our study of the three of the main characters in the story of the first Christmas, we found that Often such interruptions can be God's wonderful blessings in disguise. However, most of us don't experience such interruptions, at least not every year. Life seems to be going on just swimmingly. There is not anything really wrong. But for some reason, we just don't find the joy in Christmas that we expect. It is not providing the emotional lift that we had hoped for. In fact, it's almost depressing. The world doesn't look like a winter wonderland. It just looks like, well, winter. Disillusionment at Christmas is not really an unusual thing. Well, what can you do this Christmas to avoid such disillusionment? How can you improve your level of joy this Christmas? Well, in the story of the Magi found in Matthew chapter 2, we can find some of the answers to this question. Matthew tells us, beginning with verse 1, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now after they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, They returned to their country by another route. Well, this morning I don't want to take a lot of time to uh, fill out the finer details of this story. Uh, I will say that probably what you thought you knew about the story is either not true or not really that important. No, there were not three magi. Well, actually, there could have been three magi, but there could have been two or four, or more, Matthew doesn't actually tell us. Uh, um, They probably rode on horses, not camels, and they probably arrived with a great entourage, not just three men. They didn't visit the manger. Uh, They arrived perhaps several months or up to two years after Christ's birth. Verse 11 says that they found a child, not a baby, in a house, not a manger. And who they were and where they are from is a mystery as well. The term magi was used for both men who practiced astrology and for highly educated scholars who studied not only astronomy, uh, but also history and natural sciences and religion. The context seems to favor the latter. 
They truly were wise men, and in Persia, they were the ones who confirmed a kingship when a new monarch was crowned. That they knew that they were seeking the king of the Jews shows that they must have studied ancient Hebrew writings from the Old Testament that would have been available for them in the East due to the Babylonian captivity. And a lot of people get all wrapped up in trying to identify this phenomenon of the star. But whether it was a naturally occurring alignment of the stars and planets creating the appearance of a new star, or if it was a miraculous occurrence of a star to suit God's purpose, is really not that important. And by the way, my position on this is that it was a miraculous event based on the fact that the star stopped over the place where the child was. God uses both natural and supernatural means to accomplish His purposes. What is important is to recognize that these Gentiles set out on a long and difficult journey following a star to find the newborn king. And the fact that they had come to worship him indicates that they recognized that he was not merely an earthly king, but something more. And by asking three questions about these wise men, we can discover how to find joy of Christmas that we seek. The first question is, who do you, what I'm sorry, what do you seek? Your level of joy at Christmas is directly related to what it is that you seek. Ask yourself this, what is it I want for Christmas? What do I want to get out of it? What is it that would make my Christmas wonderful and satisfying? Snow and a white Christmas? All the family together and happy? Finding just the right presents for each of your loved ones? Getting the presents you have been hoping for? The problem with all of these is that they can leave us disappointed. And even if they do bring us joy, that joy seems fleeting. Have you ever had that kind of experience when Christmas delivered all you had hoped for and all you thought you wanted and you still walked away disappointed? When that happens, the problem is not with Christmas. It is in our expectations. We are looking for the joy in the wrong places. We're looking for the wrong thing. The Magi show us how to increase our level of joy at Christmas by looking for the right thing. What was it they were looking for? Well, verse 2 tells us that they came to Jerusalem and they said, Where is the one who has been born the King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. They were looking for Jesus. They were looking for an opportunity to worship Jesus. Christmas was for them an opportunity to worship the Christ child. And that is what we need to be looking for if we want to find the joy of Christmas this year. We need to seek to create opportunities for authentic worship of Jesus and to experience a fresh glimpse of the one who was born the King of the Jews. Well, how do you do that? Well, uh, you are here in our service this morning listening uh, to this and participating in the music or perhaps you're watching later today on, on YouTube. That is a start, but it is only a start. See, we need to seek to worship the babe in the manger daily. Start by putting on Christmas music. And I don't mean, you know, like popular Christmas songs. I mean, really, uh, last Christmas I gave you my heart. You know, that's not a Christmas song. That's a song about a broken relationship. It's just, they play it at Christmas time because it has the word Christmas in it. Okay? And Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman, those are great stories. But what do they really have to do with our Savior? Now I'm talking about put on good Christian Christmas hymns and songs like the ones that we sang this morning. And, and then get some good uh, Christ-oriented books uh, with Christmas-themed stories to read through. Um, that, doing that daily can really keep you in touch with the joy of Christmas. And I, you know, I have a couple of books that I read through every Christmas because they just always uh, put me more in touch with what Christmas is all about. The first is... Christmas Stories by Henry Van Dyke. This is the one that has the tale of the other wise man in it and a whole lot of other uh, Christmas stories. And then this one, Christmas Stories for the Heart. Um, and this one 
uh, is the one that had the story about the, the little boy that got zapped by the electric fence and got his hearing back. That's in there. And, and a story that we're going to uh, read later on is also in this book. But there are all kinds of books like that that, um, yeah, they're focused on what the true meaning of Christmas is all about. And I would just encourage you to, to do that and to read through them this Christmas season. And then if, if you want to find joy this Christmas, daily worship of Jesus centered around the Christmas story will not leave you disappointed. The second question is, where do you look? Your level of joy at Christmas is direct, directly related to where you look. We learn from the Magi that there were wrong and right places to look for Christmas. They started out by looking in the wrong place. Um, they looked where their own human reasoning uh, told them they should look. The star indicated the birth of a new king in Israel, so the Magi went to where one would naturally expect uh, a king to be born in Israel. They went to Jerusalem and then to the palace of Herod the Great. But what a mistake that was. See, in many ways, Herod was a great king. He was an apt administrator, and he was able to avoid famine during a time of drought that struck his kingdom. He was known for his great building projects, including the great enhancements to the Second Temple in Jerusalem. But he was not a Jew. Uh, he was actually an Edomite, one of the ancient enemies of Israel. And he had been appointed by Caesar as governor over Israel, um, though he adopted for himself the title king. He was also fanatically worried about losing his throne, and he famously killed or murdered his wife and his two sons because he thought that they were going to usurp his throne. So when Herod heard the birth of the new king, he jealously sought to destroy him. But the Magi looked in the right place when they looked to God. The trip to Jerusalem hadn't been a total loss. Um, they discovered there that they should have a look in the first place to the Bible. The scribes in Jerusalem said that according to the prophecy of Micah, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. With this new information, uh, they looked again at the star and followed it to Bethlehem until it stood over the house where the child Jesus lived. We too are tempted to look at, for the joy of Christmas in the wrong places. We think that getting or giving the right gift will, we will be satisfied. We imagine that uh, being with family will be joyful. All of these can easily disappoint us. If you're looking for these things to these things for joy, you may be left with a feeling of disillusionment. Instead, looking into God's Word will help you to find joy in the Christmas season. And might I suggest centering your devotions around the Christmas story. Uh, read through the Christmas stories in the Gospels. Or, or perhaps uh, get a uh, devotional book. Um, Carol is using this one, The Glory of Christmas, uh, this year, uh, with uh, writings from uh, Chuck Swindoll, Max Lucado, and Charles Coulson. Uh, something like this. There's a whole lot in Christian, Christian bookstores uh, that are devotions devoted towards the Christmas story. So I would suggest that you would pick one of those up. And then the final question is, what do you give? Your level of joy at Christmas is directly related to what you give. The Magi came to Jesus bearing gifts. The gifts they gave were appropriate. Uh, not because of what they represented. Scholars have spent a lot of time detailing that this gift represents this and that gift represents that. The only problem is, is that no one seems to agree uh, on what each gift actually represents. Everybody has their own idea, and that is because they are reading something into the story that isn't really there. The point of the gifts is that they were very expensive. They were expensive gifts, and so they were appropriate gifts for a king, especially for the king of kings. Well, what gifts should we bring? There are all kinds of suggestions. We can give the gift of our love and kindness to our friends and family. We can give our dollars um, to help those who are hurting. We can volunteer our time in a homeless shelter. These are all good things. But I think there is a deeper kind of gift that we can give. 
that we need to give. And we need to give it to Jesus Himself. This kind of gift is illustrated by one of my favorite uh, Christmas stories, The Secret of the Gifts, by Paul Flukey. He writes, The story has been told now for centuries. The story of Gaspar, Melchior, and Belshazzar, and gifts they brought to the newborn king. And of how they saw a star and followed it for weeks across the mountain and valley and desert. In stately procession on their swaying beasts, they came and, and placed their treasures at the feet of the infant Savior. And what were the gifts? Ah, you say, everyone knows that. They brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. So, since the earliest days, the story has been told. But there you are wrong. The story is incomplete. You see, the story was told by those who had seen the wise men on their journey, and by those who stood by in wonderment as the wise men dismounted from their weary camels and strode into the door of the rude stable. They watched as the wise men held their jeweled caskets before them. That much the world saw. And so the story has been told. But that is not the whole story. And if you listen very carefully and very quietly, you shall hear the rest of it. You shall hear what happened when the wise men entered the stable. And you shall learn the secret of the gifts. The first of the three visitors to approach the stable was Gaspar. His cloak was of the finest velvet trimmed with flawless fur. At his waist and throat were clusters of gems, for Gaspar was a wealthy man. Those who watched saw only that he paused at the door. He prays, they whispered to one another as they saw Gaspar's lips move. But they were mistaken. They could not see it was an angel Gabriel guarding the holy place before, Gaspar, before whom Gaspar stopped. And who are you? The voice of the angel was firm but not unkind. I am Gaspar. I come to worship the king. All who enter must bring a gift. Have you a gift? I have indeed. He held aloft a finely wrought box. It was small yet so heavy in his arms that he could hardly raise it. I have brought bars of the purest gold. Your gift must be the essence of yourself. It must be of something precious to your soul. Such have I brought, Gaspar spoke confidently, the hint of smile uh, across his lips. So shall it be. And he too smiled as he held the door for Gaspar to enter. And there before the rough board of wall of the stable lay the king he had traveled so far to see. Gaspar advanced a step, then another. He was just about to kneel and lay his gold before the child when he stopped and stood erect. There in his outstretched hands lay not gold, but a hammer. Its scarred and blackened head was larger than a man's fist, and its handle was of sinewy wood, as long as a man's forearm. But, but, so shall it be, and so it is. You have brought the essence of yourself. A hammer? What foul magic is this? None but the magic of truth, the angel said. What you hold in your hand is a hammer of your greed. You have used it to pound wealth from those who labor so that, they may live, so that you may live in luxury. You have used it to build a mansion for yourself while others dwell in hovels. You have raised it against friends and made them into enemies and, en and against enemies to destroy them. And suddenly Gaspar knew the truth. Bowed with shame, he turned towards the door to leave, but the angel blocked his way. No, you have not offered your gift. Give this? I cannot give this to the king. But you must. That is why you came. And you cannot take it back with you. It's too heavy. You have carried it for so many years, even now your arms ache at its weight. You must leave it here or it will destroy you. And once again, Gaspar knew the angel spoke the truth. But still he protested. The hammer is too heavy. Why, the child cannot lift it. He is the only one who can but it's dangerous. He might bruise his hands or his feet. That worry you must leave to heaven. The hammer shall find its place. Slowly Gaspar turned to where the Christ child lay, and slowly he placed the ugly hammer at the baby's feet. Then he rose and turned to the door, pausing only for an instant to look back at the tiny Savior before he rushed outside. 
The waiting world saw only the smile that wreathed Gaspar's face as he emerged from the stable. His hands were raised as though the wings of angels graced his fingers. That much the world saw, and so the story is told. Next to step to the door was Melchior, the learned Melchior. He was not so resplendent as Gaspar. He wore the darker robes of the scholar. But the length of his beard and the furrows in his brow spoke of one who had lived long with the wisdom of the ages. A hush fell over the onlookers as he too paused at the door. But only Melchior could see the angel who stood guard. Only Melchior could hear him speak. What have you brought? I bring frankincense, the fragrance of hidden lands and bygone days. Your gift must be something that is precious to your soul. Of course it is. Then he entered, then enter and we shall see. And Gabriel opened the door. Melchior stood breathless before the scene within. In all of his many years of searching for the elusive truth, he had never sensed such a presence as this. He knelt reverently, and from beneath his robe he withdrew the silver flask of precious ointment. But when he drew back, but then he drew back and stared. The vessel was not silver at all. It was common clay, rough and grained as it might be found in the humblest cupboard. Aghast, he pulled the stopper from its mouth and sniffed the contents. And then he leapt to his feet, only to face the angel at the door. I have been tricked! This is not frankincense I brought. What is it then? It is vinegar. So shall it be, and so it is. You have brought what what you are made of. You bring the bitterness of your heart, the soured wine of life, turned grim with jealousy and hate. You have carried within you too long the memory of old hurts. You have hoarded your resentment and breathed on sparks of anger until you have become embers smoldering within you. You have sought for, for knowledge, but you have filled your life with poison. As he heard these words, Melchior's shoulders dropped. He turned his face from Gabriel and fumbled with his robe as though to hide the earthen jar. Silently, he sidled towards the door. And Gabriel smiled gently and placed his hand on Melchior's arm. Wait, you must leave your gift. How I wish I could. How I have longed and yearned to empty my soul of this bitterness. You have spoken the truth, my friend. But I cannot leave it here, not here at the feet of love and innocence. But you can and you must if you would be clean. This is the only place that you can leave it. But... This vile and bitter stuff. What if the child should touch it to his lips? You must leave that worry to heaven. There is a use even for vinegar. So Melchior placed his gift before the Savior. And they say that when he came out of the stable, his eyes shone with the clearest light of heaven's truth. His skin was smooth as a youth, and he lifted his face to gaze on the horizons he had never seen before. And in that, at least, the story is correct. There was yet one more visitor to make his offering. He strode forward, now his back as straight as a tree, shoulders firm as an oaken beam. He walked as one born to command. This was Belshazzar, leader of many legions, scourge of walled cities. Before him, as he grasped it by its handle of polished ebony, he carried a brass-bound box. A murmur ran through the crowd who watched as they saw him hesitate before the door. Look, they whispered, even the great Belshazzar, Belshazzar bows before the king who waits within. But it was Gabriel who caused the warrior to pause. And we know, too, the question that he put. Have you a gift? Of course, I bring a gift of myrrh, the most precious booty from my boldest conquest. Many have fought and died for centuries for such as this. It is the essence of the rarest herbs. But is it the essence of yourself? It is. Then come, said the angel, and we shall see. Even the fearless Belshazzar was not prepared for the wave of awe that struck him as he entered. He felt a weakness in his knees such as he had never known before. Closing his eyes, he knelt and shuffled forward through the straw in reverence. Then bowing until his face was near the ground, he slowly released his grip upon the handle of the box. Belshazzar raised his head 
and opened his eyes. What lay before him at the baby's feet was his own spear, its smooth round shaft still glistening where the sweat of his palms had moistened it. And the razor edges of its steely tip caught the flickering light of a lamp. It cannot be. Some enemy has cast a spell. That is more true than you know. A thousand enemies have cast their spell on you and turned your soul into a spear. Living only to conquer, you have been conquered. For a moment, Belshazzar hesitated. Then taking control of himself, he reached down and grasped the spear and turned towards towards the door. I cannot leave this here. My people need it. We cannot afford to give it up. Are you sure, said Gabriel, that you can afford to keep it? A long moment passed. Finally, Belshazzar loosened his grip and the spear dropped to the floor. But as he looked at the child, he whispered anxiously, but here, is it safe to leave it here? This is the only safe place to leave it. But he is a child, and the spear is sharp. It could pierce his flesh. That fear you must leave to heaven, Gabriel replied. And they say that Belshazzar left calmly, his arms hanging gently at his sides. They say that he walked first to Gaspar and Melchior, where they waited and embraced them as brothers. Then turning to the others who watched, he went first to one and then to the next, enfolding each of his, in his outstretched arms as one greeting beloved friends whom he had not seen for a very long time. And now you know the whole of it, the truth of the tale as it has always been told, and the deeper truths of the tale as it actually happened so long ago. But what of their gifts? What of the hammer and the vinegar and the spear? Strange gifts to give to a child. Strange offerings to lay before a king. Well, there is another story about them and how they were seen once more years later on a lonely hill outside Jerusalem. But do not worry. That is a burden heaven took upon itself as only heaven can. You see, the joy of Christmas is not for this season. It is for the whole year. And if you are struggling to find the joy of Christmas, perhaps it is because you have not brought the gifts to the king that are the true essence of yourself. Perhaps like Gaspar, you have let the love of money rule your heart. Or like Melchior, jealousy, hate, bitterness, the memory of old wounds, and the desire for revenge have enslaved your heart. Or like Belshazzar, you have allowed contentious spirit to rule your life, always seeking to win every battle, large or small, no matter who it hurts. Or perhaps it is any number of, any, of a number of any other sins. Such sins will always prevent you from experiencing and finding the joy of Christmas. Perhaps this Christmas it, is t- Christmas it is time to let go of those old hurts and obsessions that cloud your life and cause you to stumble instead of experiencing joyful Christian living. All you have to do is to bring these things, whatever they are, and lay them at the feet of Christ as your gift to Him this Christmas. Strange gifts for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Perhaps... But these are the gifts that the Savior desires, for this is why He came. In Matthew 11, verses 28-30, through 30, Jesus said, Come to Me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for My yoke is easy and My burden is light. You are never meant to carry these burdens. Give them to Jesus, and He will carry them. This is the burden that Christ took upon Himself as only He could. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we uh, seek to find the joy of Christmas this year, may we learn to seek the right things, to look in the right places, and to bring the right gifts. The gifts that truly reflect who we are, and the struggles that we face, that we would lay them at the feet of Christ, that we would unburden ourselves so that He can pick them up and carry them for us, and so that we can put on the gift of eternal life that He offers to us. For it's in Christ's name that we pray.
Amen. Then for next week, uh, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, and our benediction from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this week and throughout the Christmas season. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week, God willing.